the seven wonders of the ancient world by edgar j banks the tomb of king mausolus please like this video so that more people have access to this content enjoy and also follow this channel to see other videos about art the tomb of king mausolus in the southern part of asia minor running parallel with the mediterranean coast is an almost impassable mountain range the foothills between the mountains and the sea practically separated from the rest of the world were the old kingdom of caria now that ancient kingdom is a little corner of the turkish velayette of aden deep bays cutting far into the land were the safe retreats for the pirates of old when they used to haunt the coast to prey upon the passing merchant ships and the mountains then covered with huge pines supplied them with an abundance of material for their boats tradition says that in the very early days when the tyrian galleys roamed over the seas a party of phoenicians attracted by the safe harbors settled there but probably others had occupied the land before them some believe that the asiatic lalages or carrions as they were later called were the first to inhabit the place and that their first city stood on the little island of zephyria at the head of the gulf of cause where you may now see the castle of st peter however minas the renowned king of crete compelled the carrion pirates to move to the mainland there they built the city of mylasa there they won renown for their skill in making weapons and there they became a nation so great that homer honoured them by calling them the allies of the illustrious priam of troy at the head of the gulf of cause close by the little island where the pirate village stood and where the little turkish town of budrum now stands was the city of halicarnassus some claim that halicarnassus was of divine origin that it was founded by anthus the son of the god poseidon others believe that migrating greeks settled in the land and mingled with the carrions it was at halicarnassus that the illustrious historian herodotus was born and where he lived until he was exiled long lines of independent kings lived and ruled at mylasa until finally in three hundred eighty seven b c the persian power spread over the land hecatomnus the carrion king then became the persian satrap or ruler and the country was still practically free mausolus or mausolus if you wish to write his name that way and artemisia his sister were two of the children of hecatomnus history tells us that they were both endowed with remarkable beauty and wisdom and so devoted were they to each other that when they had grown to a marriageable age they became husband and wife it was the custom in the royal family of caria for brothers and sisters to marry just as now a european crown prince is required to take a wife from some royal family few marriages have been happier than that of this brother and sister it is said that when mausolus died the heart-broken artemisia cremated the body of her husband and mixed the ashes with the wine which she drank the tomb she erected for him was one of the seven wonders of the world it was in the year three hundred seventy seven b c that hecatomnus died and that mausolus and his sister wife came to the throne as the representatives of the persian king but mausolus chafed under the persian yoke rebelled and threw it off then he invaded lycia and ionia and several of the islands and added them to his kingdom and never in all its history did caria enjoy such prosperity the old city of mylasa no longer seemed worthy of being the home of the king so mausolus removed his residence to halicarnassus which he sought to make the most beautiful city in the whole world with the plea that the old city walls of halicarnassus should be enlarged and made worthy of the capital of the kingdom mausolus extorted vast sums of money from the people of mylasa however it was rumoured about that he used the money for beautifying the city or that he secreted it for himself and that later it was used for the building of his tomb 
in the most sightly spot in the city commanding a view of the entire walls and of the harbour he built his palace he protected the harbour and with a mole he formed a secret inner harbour by the palace where his fleet of a hundred ships might safely anchor invisible to the enemy to increase the population of the city he compelled the people of mylasa and of several other towns to abandon their homes and settle there he constructed temples and theatres and soon halicarnassus became a centre of culture he struck his own silver coins which bore the head of apollo on one side and of zeus on the other for all of this still more money was required and to obtain it mausolus taxed his people heavily discontent arose yet when he died in the year three hundred fifty three b c only the good of him was remembered it was forgotten that he was extortionate and unscrupulous it was a wonderful funeral with which the broken-hearted artemisia honoured her husband according to the custom there were funeral games for many days renowned poets and orators read their poems and delivered their orations theodectus the illustrious poet who was the pupil of plato and the friend of aristotle won the offered prize perhaps because he was the most enthusiastic in eulogizing the dead king but his poem no longer survives when artemisia succeeded mausolus to the throne her one great thought was to honour her brother husband though the beautiful city was a monument worthy of any man artemisia planned to build for him a tomb which would outshine in splendour all other buildings and perpetuate his name to the end of time and she succeeded it was the custom of the kings of many ancient lands to build their own tombs and it is supposed that mausolus may have planned his tomb and began its construction but that we may never know the site selected for it was at the head of the gulf upon an elevated spot in the centre of the city between the temple of mars and the market-place the most renowned architects satyros and pythas were engaged the sculptors were scopus leocaris bryaxus and timotheus all rivals for the first place in the world of art pythas the architect sculptured the famous chariot group surmounting the tomb but artemisia was not left in peace to mourn her husband and to build his tomb the hand of mausolus had rested heavily upon the people he had subdued and now they sought their freedom but the woman who was capable of building the most beautiful of all tombs was no less skilful as a ruler the inhabitants of rhodes ridiculed the idea that a woman could rule caria and confident of an easy victory over her sent their fleet against halicarnassus artemisia learning of their plans secreted her ships in the inner harbour and stationed her soldiers on the walls as the fleet approached the soldiers in accordance with her instructions seemed to surrender and the rhodians abandoning their ships went ashore to take possession of the city no sooner had they landed than artemisia sailed from the secret harbour and captured the entire rhodian fleet while the soldiers rushing from the walls down into the city surrounded the enemy in the market-place and cut them to pieces artemisia however was not contented with the capture of the hostile fleet immediately she manned the rhodian ships with her own seamen decked them out gaily with laurel and sailed for rhodes when she appeared off the island the people thought their fleet was returning home in triumph and joyfully welcomed it into the harbour soon they saw their mistake for the leaders were quickly put to death and the island remained subject to artemisia in a public square of Rhodes was erected to the victorious queen one of the many large bronze statues for which the city was famous until the larger colossus of Rhodes outshone them all. There it stood till Artemisia died and Rhodes became free when the statue, so hated by the people, was removed in the meantime the construction of the tomb progressed but queen artemisia was not destined to see it completed for two years she mourned her brother-husband and then 
in 351 B.C., she was buried with him. With the death of Artemisia, work upon the tomb was not permitted to cease. Each of the four sculptors had been given one of its sides to adorn, and each eagerly sought to surpass the others in the excellency of his workmanship. When the funds were exhausted, the work became a labor of love. Fame would be the reward. It is not known in just what year the tomb was completed, yet it was completed, and all who saw it marveled. The ancient writers were fond of describing the mausoleum. Travelers of the Middle Ages have told how it perished, and recent excavations at Halicarnassus have brought to light its ruins. One of the tritest of the ancient descriptions of it was when Anaxagora saw it and exclaimed, How much money has changed into stone! The best of the early descriptions is that of Pliny, who lived after it had already been standing four centuries. Naming the artists employed in its construction, he says, Artemisia made this sepulchre for her husband, Mausolus, prince of Caria, who died in the second year of the hundred and seventh Olympiad. It was chiefly due to the artists whom I have already named that the work was reckoned among the seven wonders. On the south and north it extends one hundred sixty-three feet, being shorter in the fronts, its entire circumference is 411 feet. It is raised in height 25 cubits. Round it are 36 columns. The part surrounding the tomb was called the Teron. The sculptures on the east side were by Scopus, on the north by Bryaxis, on the south by Timotheus, on the west by Leocaris. Before the artists terminated their labors, Queen Artemisia died, but they did not cease from their work till it was completely finished, regarding it as a monument of their own fame and of art. To this day, it is a matter of dispute which of the four masterpieces is the finest. With these sculptors, a fifth artist was associated, for, above the Terran, a pyramid equaled the lower height, contracting by twenty-four steps to a point like that of a meta. On the summit is a marble chariot with four horses, the work of Pythus. The addition of this made the height of the entire work 140 feet. The ancient accounts of the tomb are so confusing and contradictory that modern scholars who have attempted to reconstruct it from them have had little success. Could Queen Artemisia awake to see the steeple of St. George's Church in Bloomsbury, England, modelled, so the architect thought, after the famous tomb, she would probably fail to see a resemblance. The excavations at Halicarnassus, however, have at last given us more accurate knowledge, and the Temple of the Scottish Rite in Washington is a more accurate reconstruction. To prepare the foundation of the tomb, the architects leveled the native rock, digging it away upon one side to the depth of fifteen feet. The foundation, laid upon this rock, measured 127 feet from east to west, and 108 from north to south. It was therefore not quite square. The greenish stone of its foundation was quarried in the vicinity, and shaped into blocks averaging four feet square and one foot in thickness. They were held together with iron clamps. Through the foundation wall led a passageway, lined with marble slabs, to the sepulchral chamber within. Upon the foundation stood the rectangular podium, or basement, of the tomb, measuring 114 by 92 feet. It also was built of green stone encased with marble. Groups of statuary stood about its base, and the bareness of the walls was relieved with sculptured slabs. At the four corners were stone platforms with equestrian groups. Upon the podium stood the Terran, or the enclosure of the cella, like a square stage surrounded with thirty-six fluted columns of the Ionic order, twenty-nine feet high and placed ten feet apart. 
between the columns stood marble statues and above them extending about the four sides of the building was the wonderful frieze with which the greatest artists of the ancient world sought to perpetuate their fame on one side was sculptured the combat between the greeks and the amazons on another was the battle of the centaurs the subjects of the sculptures on the other two sides are no longer certain above the frieze was the cornice of a simple echinus pattern and at each of its corners and at intervals along its sides were sculptured lion's heads next came the pyramid measuring at the base of its longer side one hundred five feet and five inches its twenty-four steps were built of marble slabs each four feet long and fifteen inches in thickness grooves with tongues to fit them and iron clamps held them in place surmounting the pyramid was a platform about twenty-five and a half feet long and five feet less in width to support the famous chariot group which was the crowning glory of the tomb four huge horses twelve feet in length were attached to the chariot with harnesses of bronze the wheels of the chariot were seven feet and seven inches in diameter and the alternate spaces between the six spokes were closed for greater strength within the chariot stood the large statue of king mausolus and with him either in the chariot or on the pedestal at his side was the statue of a female attendant possibly his devoted wife artemisia fully one-fourth of the chariot group has been recovered including the statue of mausolus and this is fortunate for it is one of the best portrait statues from the ancient world it stands nine feet and ten inches in height the statue of his female attendant is fourteen inches shorter if now you will look upon the portrait of king mausolus you will see a square massive face with deep-set eyes heavy brows and a firm mouth a thick short beard covers the lower part of the face and heavy hair hangs down nearly to the shoulders the face and the form suggest a large strong active man unfortunately the face of the female figure has been broken away should a structure of marble similar to the mausoleum be erected at the present time as the temple of the scottish rite in washington it would probably remain one great mass of shining white beauty of the stone would suffice but the ancient sculptors were not so easily satisfied the parts of the statues representing flesh were tinted the eyes and hair were of their natural colour the clothing was of brilliant hues the lions and horses were painted the ground for the sculptures and ornaments was blue and the mouldings were red even the white marble of the walls which was left unpainted was toned down with a coat of varnish or of wax to relieve it of its dazzling glare such was the appearance of the exterior of the mausoleum it was not its magnitude which won it admiration for it covered but half the area of the parthenon yet it was about twice as high the graceful outlines the harmonious colouring the profusion of statues and reliefs artistically placed the perfection of the minutest details and especially the best work by the most famous artists brought it fame our knowledge of the interior is meagre in the basement was the sepulchral chamber to which the body of the king was taken through a narrow passageway a huge stone was arranged to fall into place after the burial completely blocking up the entrance and leaving the body with the treasures beyond the reach of the grave robber we no longer know if artemisia was placed to rest in the chamber with her husband or in the larger space above from the floor above the sepulchral chamber the view upward revealed tier after tier of columns and galleries one above the other to the apex of the pyramid how the stairways were arranged or how the interior was lighted we may only conjecture however here and there in the semi-darkness sculptured reliefs stood boldly out and statues of men guarded the tomb below 
there was such an effect of lightness about the mausoleum that the report persistently floated about the ancient world that it was suspended in the air when artemisia died she was succeeded to the throne by her brother idrius it was probably during his reign that the tomb was completed idrius married his sister ada who after her husband's death asked alexander the great if she might adopt him as her son ada was banished by another brother with the rise of alexander the dynasty of hecatomnus came to an end and caria became a part of his empire changes followed rapidly menander antigonus lysimachus ptolemy antiochus epiphanus and the romans in turn ruled the land but the tomb continued in all its beauty travellers from afar came to see it lucian in his dialogues of the dead makes mausolus to say besides that personal superiority i am beautiful tall of stature and of so robust a constitution as enabled me to sustain all the hardships and fatigues of war but to be brief the principal point is i have a prodigious monument raised over me at helicarnassus which for magnitude and beauty has not its equal in the whole world it is decorated with the most exquisite figures of men and horses all carried to such a degree of perfection and in such exceedingly fine marbles as you will not easily find even in a temple lucian later makes diogenes humorously to remark in reply as to your monument and the costly marble of which it is built the inhabitants of halicarnassus may certainly have reason to show it to strangers and to think much of themselves for possessing so costly a work within their walls but my handsome friend i do not see what sort of enjoyment you should have in it you should only say that you have a heavier load than the rest of us since you have such an enormous heap of stones lying upon you by the beginning of the christian era halicarnassus was nearly deserted and the mausoleum still standing was unguarded cicero the orator accused varus of carrying away its statues once in the time of quintus an effort was made to restore the city later the jews sought to build a temple there but the old carrion capital slowly declined and in time it was almost forgotten only the tomb remained in the fourth christian century gregory remarked that it had not been plundered constantine of the tenth century says that it was still standing and even in the twelfth century a traveller writes that it was and is a wonder some time before the year fourteen hundred two a severe earthquake shook the mausoleum the chariot group at the top was hurled from the pedestal far to the north and buried in the dirt with it fell the statue of mausolus breaking into more than fifty pieces the statue of his attendant fared even worse the pyramid collapsed and the beautiful frieze fell amid the ruins and was broken in fourteen hundred two the knights of st john of jerusalem took halicarnassus which then bore the name of Misi, and the german knight henry schlegelholtz built the fortress of st peter which is still standing the stones for the castle were taken from the mausoleum its sculptured marble slabs were converted to lime for cement yet the artistic nature of the knight prompted him to build some of the reliefs into the castle wall the building and the repairs of the castle extended over a century yet the base of the mausoleum with the sepulchral chamber still remained at lyons france in fifteen hundred eighty one there were published the works of guichard containing the following story which appears to be true it describes the final disappearance of the parts of the mausoleum which had escaped the plundering knights in the year fifteen hundred forty two when sultan solomon was preparing to attack rhodes the grand master knowing the importance of the castle of st peter and being aware that the turks would seize it easily at the first assault 
sent some knights thither to repair the fortress and make all due preparations to resist the enemy among the number of those sent was the commander de la tourette a lyonese knight who was afterwards present at the taking of rhodes and came to france where he related what i am now about to narrate to m de la Chambre, a person sufficiently known by his learned writings and whose name i mention here only for the purpose of publishing my authority for so singular a story when the knights had arrived at misi they at once commenced fortifying the castle and looking about for stones wherewith to make lime found no more suitable or more easily got at than certain steps of white marble raised in the form of a terrace in the middle of a level field near the port which had formerly been the great place of halicarnassus they therefore pulled down and took away these marble steps and finding the stone good proceeded after having destroyed the little masonry remaining above ground to dig down in the hope of finding more in this attempt they had great success for in a short time they perceived that the deeper they went the more the structure was enlarged at the base supplying them not only with stone for making lime but also for building after four or five days having laid bare a great space one afternoon they saw an opening as into a cellar taking a candle they let themselves down through this opening and found that it led into a fine large square apartment ornamented all round with columns of marble with their bases capitals architrave frieze and cornices engraved and sculptured in half-relief the space between the columns was lined with slabs and marbles of different colours ornamented with mouldings and sculptures in harmony with the rest of the work and inserted in the white ground of the walls where battle scenes were represented sculptured in relief having at first admired these works and entertained their fancy with the singularity of the sculpture they pulled it to pieces and broke up the whole of it applying it to the same purposes as the rest besides this apartment they found afterwards a very low door which led into another apartment serving as an antechamber where was a sepulchre with its vase and helmet of white marble very beautiful and of marvellous lustre this sepulchre for want of time they did not open the retreat having been sounded the day after when they returned they found the tomb opened and the earth all round strewn with fragments of cloth of gold and spangles of the same metal which made them suppose that the pirates who hovered along the coast having some inkling of what had been discovered had visited the place during the night and had removed the lid of the sepulchre it is supposed that they discovered in it much treasure it was thus that the magnificent tomb which ranked among the seven wonders of the world after having escaped the fury of the barbarians and remained standing for the space of two thousand two hundred forty seven years was discovered and destroyed to repair the castle of st peter by the knights of rhodes who immediately after this were driven completely out of asia by the turks thus the tomb of mausolus perished the sepulchral chamber was plundered by pirates the sarcophagus opened and its treasures carried away soon even the sight of the mausoleum was forgotten in sixteen hundred sixty five when thevenot a french traveller visited the little turkish village of budrum as halicarnassus was then and is still called he saw the marble reliefs which the knights had built into the castle wall in eighteen hundred forty six viscount stratford de redcliffe the british ambassador to constantinople with the permission of the turkish government sent thirteen of the sculptures to the british museum where they were pointed out as all that remained of the famous tomb it was in eighteen hundred fifty five that steps were taken to excavate the ruins of halicarnassus 
Mr. Charles T. Newton, formerly of the British Museum, and then British Vice Consul at the island of Mytilene, found in the walls of the castle of St. Peter several large lions of pentelic marble. He believed that once they had adorned the mausoleum. The next year, after expending six weeks in exploring the ruins, he requested the British government to support him in their excavation. Provided with the ship Gorgon and its crew of one hundred and fifty men, and with the sum of ten thousand dollars, he obtained a firman from the Turkish government and reached Badrum in November. On the first day of January, 1857, he began the work of excavation. Guided by the statement of the ancient author, Vitruvius, that the mausoleum stood at the head of the harbor, between the marketplace and the Temple of Mars, he sought the site of the tomb. The land was owned by private individuals, and houses had been erected upon it. These he purchased. In the walls of the houses he found fragments of the famous frieze, and the ground beneath them were parts of other sculptured slabs and of statues and lions. He came to a stairway, twenty-nine feet wide, cut from the solid rock, and followed down its twelve steps to the bottom. The lowest step was buried beneath twenty feet of dirt. There, upon the native rock, the base of the foundation wall was still in place. There he found alabaster jars, one of which bore the name of the Persian king Xerxes in four different languages. There were terracotta figurines, the bones of oxen, a small ivory elephant half an inch in length, an iron dagger, and a marble casket with its sides sculptured in low relief. There, too, was the huge square stone of ten thousand pounds weight, which had closed the entrance to the sepulchral chamber. A little to the north, buried in the dirt, were the fragments of the chariot group with the statues of Mausolus and his companion, just where they had fallen. The fragments of twenty lions and of many of the statues and steps of the pyramid were recovered. The fortress of St. Peter was again carefully explored, and still other fragments were found. High up in the walls was the torso of one of the horses of the chariot group, punctured with bullets. The modern Turks of Budrum had used it as a target. Piece by piece, all of the fragments that had escaped the hands of the destructive knights were gathered and sent to the British Museum. Each piece was carefully studied to learn just what place it had occupied, and at last, after more than half a century, the architect may draw a fairly accurate picture of the mausoleum. So if you would see all that is left of this wonder of the world, it would be of little purpose to visit the site of the old city of Halicarnassus. In the castle of St. Peter you would see the great blocks of green stone of its foundation. In the field at the head of the harbor, among the squalid Turkish homes, you would stand upon the spot where it stood. But it is in the British Museum that you will find the best of all that has survived of the wonderful monument, the broken silent witnesses of the wonderful love of Queen Artemisia for her brother husband, Mausolus. We hope you enjoyed this video. Please let us know in the comments what other art contents you would like to see. And don't forget to like this video and follow our channel. Thank you, and until the next video. Thank you.